I read Marx, I read Gandhi, but the people who really inspired me were the very ordinary people who were doing such extraordinary work. Extraordinary work. The people who were simple, the people who were tolerant, the people who were compassionate. I found that the people who were very poor the most compassionate. I found the people who were very poor the most generous. I found the people who had almost nothing would share. So my name is Bankar Roy. I was born in an influential family in Bengal and I went to a very elitist school and college in India. I went to a school called the Doon School up in Dehradun, which produces prime ministers and presidents and cabinet ministers. And I went to St. Stephen's College, which produces all the bureaucrats of the country and the diplomats. So this combination was just right for me to Get a, to get a job in any company or service or become a diplomat, but I chose to live and work in a village because I found on my first visit to a village in Bihar in 1965, I saw hunger, death and starvation for the first time. And I thought that if I had gone through a very good education, so-called, I needed to give something back to society. So with no qualification to do this sort of work, with absolutely no uh, background and no experience, I became an unskilled laborer digging wells in Rajasthan in 1967. And for five years I was just digging wells in, for water with very ordinary people. And that's when I was exposed to the most extraordinary knowledge, skills and wisdom that very poor people have, which is which you don't read about it or hear about it in school and college. And this was the richness of India. This is what Mahatma Gandhi talked about. And I felt that why don't we bring this knowledge, skill and wisdom into mainstream. And later I found that this knowledge, skill and wisdom is not only identified and respected in India, but all over the world. So why is it that this knowledge, skill and wisdom that people see, respect, apply on a large scale, why is it not brought into mainstream? So that is why the idea of the Barefoot College started. How do you bring this traditional knowledge, practical skills, village wisdom into mainstream? Hundreds of years old, still respected. So the Barefoot College actually celebrates this traditional knowledge skills by showing and setting an example. In 1986, we built the Barefoot College and the someone who can't still read and write today built it at $1.50 a square foot, still standing today, doesn't leak, still uh, very strong, still very durable. This actually really was the real education that started for me. Of course, my wife was a great inspiration for me too because she herself is an activist, much more of an activist than I am. And she uh, was responsible for any acts of parliament which are still uh, being uh, used today. So she was really concerned about the political space in this country, how the discourse was being uh, compromised and how it was uh, how it was shrinking minority must feel free they must feel confident and they must have they must feel secure in this country the poor must feel that they have a say in what's going to happen in this country and they must know what share of it they will get the women in this country must know what they will get and so, they must be part of the planning process they have to be participating right. in it they can't be just targets and we can't listen to any one person saying that's what is best for us. We need to decide for ourselves what is best and that's what democracy is all about. 
and she worked in the political sphere. But for me, my whole strength was in the development side. I admired and was inspired by the work she was doing, but it was not for me because I didn't have those skills. So for me, development is very much more important because you're trying to meet basic minimum needs, water, health, education, employment. These are areas where very few people are working at the grassroots level. And I thought the Barefoot College would set an example by using the traditional knowledge to be able to provide these basic services. This is what I felt was required. And if it was down to earth, if it was Gandhian, then was it replicable? Is this something that can only be confined to the Barefoot College in Tilonia or was it possible to spread the message everywhere? So we invited young boys and girls from different parts of India to come and work with us, build up a confidence to start their own organizations. So now there are about 23 Barefoot Colleges in 13 states of India. All started as a result of being with us and then going and starting in their own states. And we thought this Gandhian model, down to earth model, could also be tried abroad. So we went with this model abroad. The government of India was very fortunate to help us with this crazy idea in how we could select, this time, only women working in the villages, in inaccessible villages which had no electricity, how we could bring these women together to India for a period of six months and see how we could convert a woman who had lost her confidence, lost her ability to think, depressed, totally marginalized, how in six months she could go back like a tiger. So this is how we felt change inexpensive, which could make a difference to their own community when they went back. And this is how we felt it could be scaled up. Today we are in 96 countries around the world, all south of the equator, who the Prime Minister of India called Solar Mamas. About 300, 3,000 Solar Mamas all over. We reached over a thousand, over 1,500 villages and Solar electrified about 75,000 houses all over. So if you put them together, it is about 1.4 gigawatts, which is about a, power, a nuclear power plant, plant produces. That is the secret, I think, of development today. How do you make it? It's not mass production, but production by the masses, as Gandhi said, which is very important, which is sustainable, which is endurable. My name is Sumita. I'm from you do this? Yes. You want a tasting? Colombia, Guatemala. Okay, this is the circuit for a uh, charge controller, which all of them are. They all do the same. Every day is like that. Yes, it's practice. So it's learned by doing. They have their book there, pictures, and it tells you what components needs to be put where. Lights and charge controllers that you see are fabricated by the trainees themselves. So what you see them make right now is the circuit for this. So then they make the circuits for this, put everything together and put, close it and that makes the light. And because they construct everything themselves, when they go back they can install it and if anything goes wrong they can open it and they can fix it. Somos cuatro mexicanas del estado de Chiapas que venimos acá. 
De igual manera llevamos ya los dos meses, casi ya somos dos meses. Y pues ha sido muy bonito porque no sabemos nada de electricidad y estamos aprendiendo. Así que, pues, ¿Qué pretende hacer cuando volver a México? Eh, instalar los paneles solares en las comunidades que realmente lo requieren. from Turkey. Uh, I'm journalist. I have been uh, uh, learning uh, solar technology and uh, I will come back in, in Turkey. Uh, we, we teach uh, solar technology to uh, a refugee woman uh, and uh, they will, uh, they will uh, be your life uh, is uh, Beautiful, uh, it's easy. Yeah, she hasn't gone to school, but everything you see here is done by her, and uh, they make use of simple techniques to learn. female reproductive system and uh, then what are the internal parts, how does it work, then why do you have um, periods and uh, what is the whole process. So it explains the whole process because there are a lot of taboos and myths and misconceptions about periods. In a lot of places they believe that it is something bad that has happened, uh, women are unclean or impure because of this. Man has migrated to the city, woman is left behind to fetch firewood, get water, take care of children, take care of elders at home, work as landless labor on the farm. She has less bandwidth left at the end of the day to actually think about herself and her own aspirations. So on our side, we at least try building some amount of economic security through these livelihoods. Right now, uh, we are incubating three ventures out here. One is for uh, production of honey through ethical apiculture or beekeeping. Production of value-added coffee products uh, through regenerative farming practices back at the farms in Andhra Pradesh and Kerala, and uh, producing nutritional supplements which are traditional and made using a recipe which is uh, age-old, community-proven, just that uh, done in a more uh, synthesized manner to address malnutrition, anemia, iron deficiency in women as well as children. The entire idea is to develop a market-based social enterprise intervention so that in future there is less dependency on grants or donations and over time it can become financially sustainable not only for us to be interacting with the communities but also for our last mile ground partners. Barefoot is a place which is uh, pollinating social change through uh, last mile intervention delivery arms that are nothing but NGOs that were earlier part of the barefoot community and uh, in mid 1980s when work was good here they moved to their home states to start building similar models. The biggest challenge I faced was how I could convince it was possible for an illiterate man and woman to be anything. An architect, a solar engineer, 
a communicator, a designer. You did not need to be literate to be able to provide these professional services. You did not need to go through a formal university to have these, to have the skills and the experience to be able to provide this service to communities. This was the first message the Barefoot College actually managed to demonstrate. The second challenge was to convince my own kind, the people who are policy planners, development planners, so-called experts, who couldn't believe that a down-to-earth, bottom-up approach was the answer to India's problem, not the top-down. What happened at the circles of Delhi is not as important as what happens in the village level. And if in the village level it can work, then you don't really need anyone from, the, from Delhi or urban areas to convince you that this is not possible. This was very important for us to convince people. We are a great believer in what Mark Twain said. Never let school interfere with your education. School is what you learn when you read and write. Education is what you get from your family, from your environment and from your community. We are trying to show that this is actually the way forward for us. It's a Gandhian message and we feel that this needs to be universalized. It's, a, it's, a, it's the only way to scale it up because the management, control and ownership of any development plan must lie with the community concerned. If you don't involve the community from the very beginning, from the planning and implementation state, it will never be sustainable, it will never carry on. And this is what the World Bank makes a big mistake, this is what UNDP makes a big mistake. They think professionals from outside with fancy degrees will be able to solve the problem, that's not the case. It cannot happen. But they haven't learnt. Over 60 years I've seen the development space globally. They just haven't learnt that that is the way forward. Take the community into confidence and then let them manage and control and own the process. We found that in villages, wherever we work, that this is the long-term solution today. We have youngsters from many parts of India who have come from urban areas, who have willingly volunteered to come and work in Thelonia. And you know the biggest problem they have is their parents. The parents think that they are wasting that time. They have no idea the challenges that these young people are facing and overcoming and enjoying the challenge that they have. So my advice to young people is this is the only time when you can take risks. This is the only time when you can really find out if you have it in you, if you have the staying power in you to be able to do this sort of work. So my first advice always when I meet youngsters in India is to get onto a train and 50 kilometers anywhere from the urban city that you are, get off at the first station and see if you can survive for one year. Don't go with money, don't go with plans, don't go with any ideas. Just see how they live and work and survive. Such a great educational experience for you. If you don't have it in you, at least you gave it a shot. If you have it in you, then that's a beginning for you. How is it possible for you, with all the education that you've got, to survive under extraordinarily simple conditions and contribute in your own way with simple solutions? Go for simple solutions. Don't go for something which takes one year. Go for something which takes a couple of days to solve. And that will give you the job satisfaction. But I find that the youth today don't have that courage, sadly. They don't have the courage to say, no, I'm going to drop this and I'm going to try it out. So when I did that 40, how many years ago? Oh, 50 years ago. Oh, my mother was totally went into a trance. She couldn't understand what I'm doing. So she wouldn't speak to me for many years. So someone asked me, when did she speak to you again? And I said, when the Prince and Princess of Wales came to Thelonia, she was a bit of a snob. So she said, oh, if the Prince and Princess of Wales can come to Thelonia, then I must be, you must be doing something right. So that took her a long time to convince each other. 
the last time they were seen together was in Thelonia. So that's the story.